Hey guys, it's Judy from Nutrition with Judy. Alright, I hope you guys are having a good week. Please make sure to subscribe, hit the bell, like this video. This allows me to provide you more free content. Okay, so this week I am very excited. I have with me Kevin Stock. If you have joined Carnivore over two years ago, then you probably know him as Meat Health. He also had this free beginner's guide to Carnivore and also a guide to Carnivore and weight loss. I will link to his information in the show notes, but he has been a wealth of information even for myself when I first started my Carnivore journey. All right, let's get right into the video. So hi, Kevin. Thanks for joining me. Well, thanks for having me. Excited to talk. Yes. Um, if you could tell us a little bit about yourself and what got you into carnivore and how long you've been in the carnivore diet. Sure. So I guess a little bit about me from a nutrition standpoint. Uh, well, I guess a little bit, uh, a quick backstory would be I've been into health and fitness for a very long time. Since junior high, I've been doing various diet experience uh, and that various diet experiments and you know, I, I say I was into health and fitness, but really I was into fitness. Like I, I had, I was an overweight kid and I wanted to get in shape. And after many years of trial and error and this and that, I feel like I finally like kind of found the right diet, which was not carnivore. This is pre-carnivore. Uh, Cause I was able to get a body composition I wanted. Uh, you know, I did, I did some physique competitions and was like a national level uh, competitor. And so I, I thought I figured out this whole nutrition game, at least from a body composition standpoint. Right. Uh, and then it was a few years ago, four years ago, four and a half years ago or so, uh, when body composition was no longer my number one priority. It was, I was working a lot at a couple of different businesses I was working on and really mental performance became like my number one priority. And I felt like I could improve there because I was drinking a lot of coffee to keep my energy going throughout the, throughout the day. I was like, you know, I, I thought maybe diet could help improve this. So uh, I had done ketogenic diet in the past, but I always say like I cheated on it because I always had my protein too high. Uh, so I decided, you know, roughly four and a half years ago or so, I was like, all right, I'm going to do a strict ketogenic diet. And really, so I limited protein to about 0.75 grams per pound uh, body weight and, you know, very high fat, very low carb. And I did not get the mental benefits that I was hoping for. I had actually lost uh, a good a significant amount of muscle, so my body composition suffered. So that kind of led me down a hole through, you know, I, I, was a, I was familiar with like plant toxins and things like that. But when I evaluated my diet, I was like, look, I'm eating a whole lot of vegetables. So I started removing those, uh, started eating more and more red meat and kind of backed my way into this, I, which I did, didn't, don't know if it was even a thing that called the carnivore diet at the time. Maybe it was uh, more like zero carb diet. Uh, but I was basically eating just meat and water. Uh, and so that, that was kind of the beginning. I started feeling better. I, my mental performance went through the roof. My body composition started improving again. Uh, and so it's been probably about three years or so that I've been, uh, on this quote unquote carnivore diet. Sure. So have you changed those kind of macros? So do you still do 0.75 grams per pound? Oh no. Yeah. Sorry. No, I went way back up. To, up. So I don't, I don't count macros okay. I, because I've, been such like a nutrition, you know, kind of nerd for lack of a better term uh, for so long. I have good idea of like what my macros are, what my calories are. I, I can ballpark figures, but I don't track them anymore. I know I'm eating far more than 0.75 grams per pound, uh, probably close to double that uh, okay. on, on a normal basis. Sure. And I think this kind of segues into, you know, one of the conversations I had uh, wanted to have with you about you know, the carnivore diet or this, you know, meat based diet and um, weight gain or weight loss, or, you know, just fine tuning um, body composition, as you're talking about. And one of the biggest complaints, and I know you've seen this because you wrote an article that I actually read when I started gaining a little bit of weight. Um, you know, you talk about how sometimes there are some sallies in the world, right, that may gain weight on carnivore. Do you want to kind of talk a little bit about that? And, you know, what are some of the solutions to, you know, maybe um, better body composition on the carnivore, you know, way of eating? Yeah. So it is, 
probably the number one question I get as well is has to do with, you know, body composition, losing fat, building muscle, uh, next to like transition symptoms. Cause a lot of, there's a lot of the issues with that as well, but probably the number one frustration is for some people, body composition. And what I, what I think is really frustrating for people is they see a lot of, in the article you're mentioning, they see a lot of the Johns, for example, who were a hundred pounds overweight. They go on this diet, they don't track a thing. They eat all the meat they want and all they see is success. They lose fat. You know, it's three months later, they've lost 80 pounds. And you see a lot of these stories. That's not uncommon. And then you have the other people who have been health conscious for a number of years, have been tried this diet, that diet, you know, et cetera. And then they go to the carnivore diet and they start gaining weight. And they're like, what is going on here? Uh, and it's very, it's, it's very common. Uh, and it has to do with, it has to do with their metabolic state. Uh, and so I guess a good example would be, let's say, let's use John as an example. Let's say he's 100 pounds overweight and he's maintaining 100 pounds overweight on 5,000 calories a day. He's not healthy metabolically by any means, but he's eating a lot. And then let's say we have, I'll just use a Kevin over here who's also 100 pounds overweight. Uh, but he's been really trying to watch his weight. He's done he's a bunch of, you know, he's kind of a yo-yo dieter. He's tried this diet, he falls off the wagon, tries this diet, falls off the wagon. And he maintains being over hundred pounds on 2000 calories a day. So when these two people go on the same diet, this John can be eating 4,000 calories a day and he's going to be losing weight. Whereas if Kevin eats 4,000 calories a day, he's gaining weight. And it has to do with their different metabolic states, the basal metabolic rate and a number of other factors, hormonal states. Uh, but what I see is quite common with people who have done a lot of dieting is their basal metabolic rate is kind of into the ground. Uh, a lot of times they have, if they're overweight, they have some degree of insulin resistance. And so they have a lot of factors that are going up against them. And so in the article you're referring to, I talk about how it can be frustrating, but I think for the people that really have body composition goals, and I'm t and I should we should we should separate the discussion between like health and body composition because they're not the same necessarily. Yeah, you can have great body composition and not be super healthy, uh, and you can have you can be slightly overweight and be very healthy metabolically. Mm -hmm. And I think for women, because they do tend to hold more body fat than men, uh, physiologically they're supposed to, anatomically they're supposed to. Uh, there can be some discouragement there. They're oh, I'm not healthy. When really, you know, they're at a healthy weight. Because uh, I, I get a common question uh, from women, and they're like, look, I want to be 14% body fat. And 14% body fat for a woman is extremely lean, actually. That's kind of like male, like competitive, like 6% body fat, something like that. Right. And so not necessarily the health objective. It's a body composition objective, which is fine. You can get to that. But uh, getting to that and feeling great and being healthy, you know, those two goals might be at odds. Sure. And I mean, I, I can give some examples. So, um, you know, I'll have women that I work with um, and they, you know, maybe have like 50 pounds to lose. So they're not, you know, super obese or anything. And, you know, they heal, you know, you know, carnivore heals so much because you remove the anti-nutrients, you have gut healing, um, you have all these things that you benefit from and they feel it. They sleep better at night. Um, you know, they don't have like the moods, uh, mood instabilities, but then they start noticing, you know, maybe they don't gain weight, um, but maybe they only lose 10 pounds. And so they're, you know, they're you know, not that they're trying to be really thin, but they still have a good 40 pounds that they can lose. Likely some of that's insulin resistance, but then they start getting frustrated with the diet. Like, you know, all these success stories, why, why am I not losing weight? I'm doing everything right. I'm eat, I'm like maybe removing some of the dairy. Um, I'm eating two times a day, you know, kind of intermittent fasting, what's up with all this. And then I try to talk about how, you know, oftentimes we've under eight. So a lot of women think 1600 calories is sufficient amount of calories. And then, you know, that whole, then you, you have to keep cutting back and it's easy to eat 1600 calories on a carnivore diet, right? Because right. we're eating for fat. <laughs> yes. Um, and so, you know, knowing all these things, um, and then also if you're, you know, very thin and then you kind of come to the carnivore diets, even there's even a higher chance you can actually gain weight. So what has been your kind of, you know, if you can talk about kind of that graph that you and I talked about, um, before yeah. about how we can, you know, increase metabolic rate, one of the you know ways that you found successful. Yep. And I actually think 
I mean, for most people, the easiest thing, and then I'll, I'll, I'll get into a little bit more complicated nuance if we want to dive into that, because I like thinking about it from like a bodybuilder perspective, because what they do during a bulk, a, a, a strategic bulk, is what I would recommend for most people. However, if people don't want to start tracking things like that, like you said, if you just start eating meat, there's a lot of healing that needs to happen first. And so you don't have to track anything. Don't worry about fat loss. If you're just eating meat, you're going to take care of a lot of healing. And I would recommend throwing in some resistance training. So if you just do those two things, you're going to start moving the needle in the right direction. Even if you don't see, you know, you know, the weight dropping off the scale, you're moving in the right direction because uh, you're starting to get metabolically healthy. And one thing I would tell people is like, if you if you're in it for long term success and you're going to start restricting what you're eating right now, because uh, that's what people will tend to they'll be like, okay, I want to start restricting. Uh, you have to be like, look, are you really going to want to? survive on 1500 calories a day the rest of your life like that's not sustainable for most people or if it is you're going to feel terrible or if we fix your metabolism and you could eat 2500 calories a day and you're full you know you're feeling full you have energy throughout the day you feel great and you can have the body composition you want that's kind of where people want to get to and the way to get to that is uh is, is fixing these metabolic issues so kind of from a bodybuilder standpoint and it's not that saying people want to be bodybuilders or anything, but it's the strategy applied just to normal life uh, can help people achieve, achieve these body composition goals. And that would be is if I'm going to go as a bodybuilder trying to, you know, increase my metabolism, what I'm going to do is I'm going to gradually eat more and more over time. Not a lot, but a little bit more over time. I'm going to in, increase my, my resistance training over time weight, volume, million different variables there. But I'm going to do those two things. And I'm actually going to not do a whole bunch of cardio. If I do anything, it's going to be more high intensity cardio, short duration, high intensity. And I'm going to follow this path of eating slightly more, more resistance training, less cardio, uh, getting good night's sleep, uh, you know, eight hours a night. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to do that for nine months, 12 months, 18 months, even 24 months. And I'll get to the point where, yes, if I continue on that and keep eating more and more and more month after month, I will put on some body fat. I'll be putting on muscle as well. My metabolism will be going up a lot. But let's just say at the end of, let's just call it 12 months, I went from eating 2,000 calories to now I'm eating 4,000 calories a day. And I've put on, let's just say, 10 pounds of fat. Well, I can lose that 10 pounds of fat by cutting a small amount of calories off that top. And now I'll be able to maintain a body I want at... 3,000 calories or something like that. Now, those are just, you know, I'm just throwing random numbers out there. But, but conceptually, that's what we want to get to is where you can have the body composition that you want, you're happy with, and you're not starving yourself. You're able to eat enough to get all the nutrients you need, the macronutrients, the micronutrients, uh, and it's so that it's sustainable long term. But like you said, sometimes it feels like you're taking a step back because sometimes you do put on some, some fat during that time. Uh, bodybuilders, the fitness models, the you know bikini models, no matter what, they don't look like that that, that magazine cover shoot twenty four seven three sixty five. Uh, they they do a similar strategy where they'll they'll you know put on some body fat and they'll put on some muscle and then they'll cut some of that body fat off. Uh, so that kind of strategy, that thinking, is what I think will help most people uh, in the long run, at least as far as finding long term success with body composition. Uh, but like I said, a lot of people don't even have to worry about it that much. If they really just have the long-term mindset of eating meat until they're satiated and they're feeling good, and if they incorporate some resistance training, most people that I find that would do that for a year, they don't have body composition issues uh, at the end of that. I think a lot of these issues come between months three, six, where you know they already lost some initial fat or water weight maybe the first couple of weeks, and then after a month, through month one through six, they start seeing the scale creep up a little bit or something like that, and they get discouraged. When really, you know, I, I like to tell people, think of that as like a healing time. Uh, and then the next six months, think about it as about like building some lean body mass time. And then at the end of that, like if you need to lose fat, you're gonna be in such a metabolically healthy place, healthier place, I should say, uh, that it'll be much, much easier uh, to lose the fat. That, that is interesting because I think, um, you know, as you're talking about these timeframes, I do feel that a lot of the kind of complaints come in between the three and six marks. So you think, oh, well, I've been doing this for 90 days, 100 days. 
Why am I not at that composition that I was expecting? And so, I mean, I think that's good to just say, you know, try it for a year. And, um, you know, like, I know you said eat to satiety, but that's one complaint I get is, I don't know where I feel satiated anymore. I can eat three, four pounds of meat in one sitting. I can eat all the chicken wings, you know, ribs, and I don't feel sated. Um, I noticed that I can eat more than, you know, the average person maybe eating one to two pounds. Um, and so what what would you say for someone like that? Well, so, so I experienced that when I was early on. I remember when I just started, I was like, all right, look, I'm gonna eat red meat until I'm full. Uh, and I was like sat like ravenously hungry. Like I was just scarfing it down like pounds and pounds and pounds. Uh, and then shortly after, I want to say six, eight weeks after, maybe six weeks, it was, I, I can't remember exactly. I lost my appetite. I was like, wasn't really feeling all that hungry all the time. And then it finally just kind of regulated itself eventually through months three and six. Uh, so I, I, a lot of that I think is re getting those hunger cues comes back over time. Uh, especially if people have done a lot of forced fasting. I, I noticed like hunger signals cues can be very far off uh, and it takes more time to kind of get used to more intuitive eating. Uh, so I think a lot of that is early on. It's, uh, it, I think it's pretty rare for someone to, to come to me to say, look, I've been doing this for a year and I, I don't know, I can't follow my appetite. Like usually by then they have it. Uh, but I, I did want to mention something about it because it is if someone comes to this diet with body composition, body composition is the number one goal. It can be frustrating, like you yeah. said, because we're like we're talking like, oh, you got to do this for a year. They'd be like, a year? Like, what about P ninety X, the ninety day thing? And you know, uh, and I've found that people that have had the most long term success on the carnivore diet, meaning they've stuck with it for more than a year, basically, they've seen benefit in some other aspect of their life that trumps the body composition. Oh yeah. So maybe they had an autoimmune condition that resolved. They're like, okay, my body composition is not exactly what I want, but because I'm feeling so good over here, I'm going to stick with it. And then the body composition slowly, you know, improves over time. Where if someone that comes in it with just body composition goals may not, uh, may not be as happy because you can get body composition goals on a lot of different diets. Like I said, I had, you know, I competed at a national level, not doing a carnivore diet. I did, I ate meat, but I, I ate other stuff. I ate carbs and things like that. Uh, so yeah i mean personally for me i mean so i went from like a vegetarian plus fish diet then i went keto on a pescatarian diet and then i added all the meat um my you know mental health um all my depression anxiety those are you know they've all you know been better now but i've gained about 10 pounds and i know that though it's not that i can't um because I've been doing it for about two years now. And it's not because I can't find my satiety. It's because like, I'll, I might still grab some like, you know, meat snacks or cheese when I'm stressed. And I notice I'm eating for not because I'm hungry, but because of, you know, emotional reasons. Like that's always, yes, that's always one thing I always say, you can't, you know, replace the candy for cheese, because yeah. you can gain weight for that too. 100%, especially if people are sensitive to cheese. That's actually really common because it's an easy snack and some people do fine with it. Some people not so much. And if they're not so much and they're snacking on it a lot, that can really, you know, that can be the one domino that, you know, makes it hard to progress. Right. And, and I have seen people that, you know, cut out the cheese and they've, you know, lost a good amount of weight or um, maybe they've removed meats that, you know, have more higher histamine. So there's all these kind of tweakings you can yep. do. Um, but you know, and I know you don't want to talk about numbers, but if we were to say what's kind of like a healthy increase over time. So like for that year, do you think like maybe an extra hundred calories? Like, I don't know, maybe an extra yeah. scoop of meat. I mean, what do yeah. you think? Yeah. And we can talk numbers cause I, I track okay. macros for okay. Yeah. So what, <laughs> yeah, uh, I mean, I think so. women get so scared. I mean, and I, I'm sure men too, but I think the, you know, if I were to say, I'm sorry, you have to gain a little bit of weight to then cut. I think people get so scared of, but what if I never lose that weight? Right. Because yeah. no one wants to struggle with that whole yo-yoing of weight for 50 years. If I could say, Hey, if you just struggle for one year forever, you don't have to, then anyone would do that. Right. But right, exactly. you, in the moment say, Hey, you're going to gain 10, 20 pounds, um, what have you, and then you can start cutting. Um, I think that fear of, but what if I'm forever that weight becomes so daunting. So yeah. what are kind of some tangible ways they can do this process? Yeah. So 
when I was talking about like adding more and more, I would say that's not until after six months for most people. Oh, okay. I, I really do think people shouldn't force overeat or force undereat early on. Most people, I think they should really just focus on getting those satiety kind of cues down, finding a baseline, like, and like for a baseline for me would be like three pounds of meat is a good average for myself. Uh, a lot of women will be one and a half pounds of meat or maybe two pounds of meat. Uh, but establishing some kind of baseline that you can move off of because when you're starting you don't have any you don't have any you need you need you need a foundation to build on and so i think building that foundation for six months is is smart and then uh you know and, and I, I keep mentioning resistance training but that really is a, a a part that we can all do to really help improve the metabolic condition because if, especially if it's an insulin resistance issue like really if someone comes to me and they have insulin resistance, I was like, look, there's two things you can do that's going to make this all better. Stop eating carbs and start doing resistance training. And like, that's like, to me is like, that's the, that's the cure right there for insulin resistance. Uh, but then, you know, if you really want to kind of take the next level and start adding in food, cause I did this, uh, I, you know, I didn't measure calories, but I was like, okay, if I, my baseline's three pounds of meat, I will eat three and a quarter pounds of meat for a month and then three and a half pounds and then three and you know, 3.75, then four, then four point. I actually did that and I was eating up to almost five pounds a day. So you can slow, like I, at least I could slowly increase my food intake to where I, like today, if I eat five pounds, I'd be, I would be really like full uncomfortable, but I was able to build up kind of my appetite over time. Uh, so, and I did put on some body fat during that time and I was able to, you know, lose it pretty, pretty easily as well. And one thing that's worth, I think mentioning is, because you're, you're talking about how people want to know, will I be able to maintain this body over time for the long run? If I eat to satiety all the fatty meat I want, I will actually have, I'll carry more body fat than my vanity wants to carry. I'll be healthy. And I'll be perfectly healthy. I'll probably be between 12 to 15% body fat, strong, sleeping great, healthy as can be. Like the, Probably my healthiest state actually is that. You know, I still like to be a little bit more leaner than that. Probably, you know, sub 12% body fat, maybe like around 10 or a little bit less. And I found for me personally, if I just eat a little bit leaner cuts, I'm not talking like chicken breast, but I'm just a little bit leaner. Uh, I can eat pretty much the satiety, three pounds of meat a day, and I can have the body composition I want. So basically I'm saying this is individually people might need to tailor yes. what they want if they have a body composition goal that's maybe outside, I don't want to say realistic because it's, it's not unrealistic, but outside, you know, the body composition that your body wants to naturally settle in at. Sure. Yes. I mean, that makes sense. I always try to tell my clients, uh, heal your body, kind of see where your body then lands after like six months. Um, and then, you know, from there, if you want to tweak, then we can, you know, adjust the macros because I mean, there's a lot of women out there that if they eat too lean of meat, then they start feeling, you know, like the hair loss or they feel fatigue. But I mean, some people do better on high protein and low fat. Um, yeah. But um, from your experience, uh, have you noticed any macro differences for women and men? Um, you know, I don't know about for women and men individually. Yes. And I think a lot of it comes down to like, kind of what we're talking about, what their goals are. Mm -hmm. And like, if, let's just say we have a female bodybuilder. I think they're going to have more success if they have higher protein. Uh, but if we have some, a female that doesn't have bodybuilder type goals, but just wants to be lean and they find that, you know, if they have higher fat, lower protein, they eat a little bit less. Well, maybe they're not going to carry as much lean body mass, not as much muscle mass, but they're able to get the body composition that they want with more of like maybe an 80, 20 fat to protein ratio. Uh, so like for me personally, if I eat like around ketogenic ratio, 70% fat, 30% protein, I feel great. Like I feel amazing. And if I eat like that to satiety, I'll be in that 12 to 15% body fat range probably, which is a little bit more than I want. So if I scale the, the fat down and the protein up a little bit, it swings me a little bit more to the leaner side. Uh, and so just basically for me, the only pro, the only, you know, the only reason I would eat more protein than the kind of ketogenic ratio is pretty much just from like a vanity standpoint, not from a health standpoint. So what about your energy levels though? So compared to when you're more maybe like a deeper ketogenic state versus, you know, a little bit more higher protein for, you know, body composition than... Do you, do you feel any difference in your energy? 
So yeah, I've swung the bar too far. I've swung the, the pendulum too far to one side where it's, it's super like, okay, not enough fat at all, very high protein, no, no carbs, where the energy starts suffering, sleep starts suffering, you know, body composition doesn't suffer too much, but, but everything else starts to suffer. And so I've kind of found this, for me, I'll call it a little sweet spot where I know if I'm eating this much fat, uh, I'm close to is feeling as good as I would if I was more ketogenic ratios from a, you know, energy standpoint, sleep standpoint, everything standpoint. Sure. Uh, and you know, I've done some, you know, experiments or, or whatnot where, you know, I will swing the pendulum really high, really far on the high protein side, lower fat. And then I'll put in a higher fat day every other day or every third day or every fourth day. And I, that actually, like if I was going to have, what if I want to get super lean, that's what I would do to do that. I would have this really high protein, lower fat day or days, and then I would cycle in higher fat days for me. That's what, that's what would, you know, that's what would do it. Uh, but there's a fine line balancing that and feeling your best. Sure. Have you tested your glucose levels or your ketones on those days that you are consuming more protein and less ketone or I'm sorry, less fat? I have not. Uh, I used to test ketones when I was, you know, more in the ketogenic and I was, I was, I was trying to figure out if the, you know, deeper ketosis was going to help my mental performance. And, you know, for me, it, it really, I didn't see that. Uh, you know, I could test very deep in ketosis and very light in ketosis and it really didn't make a big difference to me. And so for me, it doesn't matter very much. I don't, I don't really care what the depth is. I'm sure I'm going in and out of varying depth of ketosis. Uh, for example, if I eat an early dinner, let's say 4 p.m., which isn't uncommon, and then I go to bed, I sleep all night, and I eat a high-fat breakfast, which I normally do. That's normally my fattiest meal of the day. You know, by lunchtime, like I'm probably in pretty deep yes. state of ketosis. Well, then maybe if I have a higher protein lunch or dinner and then I'm going to shallower levels of ketosis and maybe the cycle repeats. Uh, but I don't, I don't, personally, I don't really worry about it too much. Okay. Uh, because I, I mean, we can get into the ketone discussion, but it doesn't, it doesn't really tell me all that much. It doesn't right. tell me if I'm burning my body fat or if I'm burning fat that I've eaten. It doesn't tell me how efficient, efficiently I'm using ketones for energy. So I, there's a lot of misleading signals that it could be sending. And you know, that's why I worry about people who test ketones all the time is, I don't know if they're getting the information that they're, they're really looking for. Uh, sure. You know, like the blood glucose, if it's really spiking up after a meal, uh, you know, obviously that's not something you want. A slow increase, postprandial, you know, blood glucose increase is something that, more something that you want. But uh, uh, I've, I've had no personal issues with like insulin resistance or diabetes or anything like that. I've checked last blood work I, you know i took my insulin it's very low fasted insulin so it's not something i'm worried about but you know if people want to check it then I, sometimes it does more harm than good as from a worrying standpoint but <laughs> sure i i mean i always recommend i'm on the same page as you so i always recommend the glucose i think it's beneficial after meals to see like how much you're spiking right if you're like above 30 points in an hour or two it's probably you know, a sign that maybe, I don't know if it's maybe too much protein, I don't know what it is, but there's something there in your meal. And it's something that you can kind of like play with. But in terms of ketones, like I've been, I, I think in general on carnivore, I'm in the one to 2.0. But on keto, I was on like 7.0 sometimes. Yeah. And um, I don't feel a difference, right? So I don't, I think it's, you know, it'll be beneficial to have some ketones. But I think when you don't have any carbs in your body, you'll have some anyway. So yeah you know, it's not as, you know, beneficial to see how high your ketones are, because, you know, they also argue that if you check blood ketones, it might be this that your body has become very efficient at burning. Exactly. Ketones. And exactly. so you won't have a lot, um, you know, floating around that are not used in your blood. So I agree, especially with you. if you've done it for a long time. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, exactly. So I'll summarize kind of this part. Um, what I'm hearing from you is, you know, we need to focus on healing our metabolic rate. One is through resistance training. Another is by maybe slowly, you know, just allow yourself to heal the first six months, no tinkering of anything. But then after six months, you may try, um, you know, resistance training. You can add, um, you know, a little bit more um, like meats, uh, protein, fat, et cetera. And then you can see if maybe you want to, you know, dial it down and figure out what macros makes you feel better. But 
um, you know, in terms of the resistance training, you know, what do you recommend for people that haven't really done resistance training? Like, um, you know, one of the reasons why resistance training is so big is because it's our lean body mass that allows our metabolic rate to, you know, work more efficiently. So um, if you can talk a little bit about that. Yes. Yeah, so there's, I guess there's a lot of advice I can give in this area because there's so much different kinds of resistance training. That's why I was just kind of leaving it as like a broad and a lot of it will work just great. There's a, a couple of pieces of advice that I would recommend. One is find something that you like, that you could learn to like, that you can learn to enjoy. Uh, Cause if it's like something you, despise doing it to me it's a short term you know thing and but what i found is people that have stuck with the gym and maybe they didn't like it initially and they really stuck with it it grows on them to the point where then it becomes something that you don't have to but you want to do it because it makes you feel good and that's the point where i recommend people you know if you can get to that point where you want to go to the gym because like oh i need this stress release i need to work this body i need i need to do it that's where, that's where I find people find success when they, when they can get to that point. Uh, getting to that point is if you can find a personal trainer, a good one, which is easier said than done, uh, they're worth their weight in gold. Uh, a good personal trainer teaching you how to do proper form, how to do the exercises, uh, teaching you a little bit of how to program, meaning like how much weight to use, how many reps, how many sets, and then how to, to you know program that over time and that it's it's not something that we could just discuss in, in a little bit because there's a million variables you know but if, if the essential concept is you want progressive overload so if you can do one bench press at five pounds today you know next week hopefully you can do two reps at five pounds and then 10 reps at five pounds and then down the road you can move up to 10 pounds and you can do five reps and then 10 reps. So it's this progressive overload concept uh, that's essential in weight training. Uh, but that being said, you don't do just hypertrophy training. That's what my, I like to do with these bodybuilding kind of exercises. Functional training, things like doing squats properly and deadlifts and bench press and overhead presses, great stuff. Uh, doing you know metabolic training, which is kind of more like I'll call it CrossFit, but you know, rowing, things like that. All these are good things that are working your muscles. Uh, and besides finding a good trainer, because uh, I know it's not, it's, it's not that a good trainer that really knows how to execute these, these movements properly is not a common thing necessarily. Mm -hmm. uh, so then the other thing is you get to self-educate. And there's a lot, you know, there's millions of videos you can learn about doing different exercises and whatnot. Um, but I guess that would be the two big pieces of advice I would get is, you know, if you could learn to love it, that's kind of number one. Number two would be is if you can find someone to help you do these things, uh, even like seeing a trainer once a week or maybe just for a month. And if he's really good, get you really to understand all the exercises so you can go perform them on your own. Cause yes, it's an expense to, you know, have to see a trainer all the time. Um, yeah, I mean, there's some online courses that I've taken that I thought were excellent as far as learning how to execute proper form and really is that's like one of the most important things is doing these exercises properly because I did them improperly for a long time and, you know, and then I end up with injuries and then you can't work out and and I now I do really do emphasize form a lot to, to people. I'm like, it's not just like trying to lift, you know, the pink dumbbells, but it's about like doing that because it's important to learn how to do these exercises right. Uh, anything else? I don't, I don't know where else to, I mean, there's a million things that you can do in the weight training realm. Sure. I mean, do you recommend people working out or like, you know, doing some resistance training every day, like at least three times a day? I know it depends on, you know, if you're working your full body or just certain yeah. muscles. I mean, what would you recommend in general? And I know this is kind of broad again, but. So, yeah, if I was a beginner, what I would recommend is doing a little bit like, you can do 20 minutes, but I would do it more frequently. I'd do it every day. Uh, so, you know, as a beginner, you're going to be lifting less weight, shorter amount of time, but you can do, but I would do more frequency. So I would do every day or six days a week or whatnot. And then as you progress, there's different strategies where it's like, maybe you're training a certain muscle group real heavy one day. So you don't want to, you want that muscle group to, you know, recover for 
72 hours before you train it in a, another day. Uh, you know, kind of a personal philosophy that I've lived by was an hour of exercise a day. And usually that's been weight training, but sometimes if I can't get weight training in, then it's going to be go walk for an hour or go do something for an hour. Uh, so that's kind of been like my personal thing. And maybe it's 20 minutes of weights and 40 minutes of, you know, go for a walk. I'm not a huge cardio person, but I just think like an hour a day of getting the body moving is a good thing. Yes. Uh, so that's just kind of my guide is an hour a day. And I don't take, I try not to take days off or I just don't move for an entire day. Right. I mean, it's good to move. Um, I do want to ask you about cardio. So, um, you know, what are some of the reasons why, you know, doing like the elliptical or just running um, a lot is not, you know, necessarily beneficial for, you know, our health? Well, so cardio, I use cardio strategically if I'm trying to get really lean. Okay. And so kind of what we were talking about, you build up and you get, you know, you got good amount of lean body mass and you still need to lose a little body fat. I use it as a tool to help lose a little bit of body fat. Um, the issue is if you're not tracking macros and you're doing cardio, you're just going to eat those calories back and probably some. So from a body composition standpoint, you're not really building any muscle with cardio and you're going to be eating more than you normally are. So you're probably going to end up at just putting on body fat. So, which is com you know, counter to most people's goals, or maybe you'll be neutral, but it's not really going to help you progress in your goal. Now, if you are, you know, counting macros and you're restricting it and you're doing cardio, it can help. It can be a tool that you can use uh, to lose fat. Um, but, you know, I use it just as mainly a tool or I use it as like a mental health thing. Like I was just talking about going for walks, like getting outside and going for a walk does like wonders for mental health and just yeah. feeling good. Uh, not so much for a body. I wouldn't go for a walk for a body composition goal. <laughs> uh, but yeah, so I kind of reserve cardio for as a tool that I can pull as a lever if I really need to lose some extra body fat. Okay, no, um, that makes a lot of sense. I've also noticed that um, if I had clients that were, you know, very into CrossFit or, you know, like running marathons, um, I noticed that their adrenals take a hit, right? Like oh, yeah, absolutely. And so that's where I've kind of shifted because I used to be a really big cardio person where I would be in the gym for two hours doing different types of cardio and I was very lean, but I mean, absolutely my hormones. I mean, you know, I struggled with mental health. So, you know, I'm not a big fan now of, you know, doing too much cardio in a week because yes, you can get very lean, but you can also take a hit on your hormones. Absolutely. And I ran cross country in high school oh, okay. and I also lifted weights every day as well. And, you know, it was a good four year experiment where it's like, if you're, you know, running cross country, I, I couldn't put on any muscle mass. Like if you're running, like I could put, and then when I got to college, stopped running, just kept on with the weight training, you know, my body just started, you know, piling on muscle. And, it, you know, I think a, a large part of that had to do with, uh, you know, just if you're if doing that much cardio, it, it's counterproductive to, to muscle building and, and sure. like you're saying it, it stresses the body as well. So that makes, I mean, that makes a lot of sense. You know, one question I wanted to ask again about this whole like calorie consumption, which before we switch over to other questions is um, when you start cutting. So when you were at that kind of five pounds a day and then you were starting to cut down, did you kind of have to, um, you know, manage your hunger um, to then cut? It's interesting question. So when I did this and I, so I did the kind of the carnivore bulk and then a carnivore cut, the cut was the easiest cut I'd ever done in my life oh. from a hunger standpoint. I, I, I was almost not hungry at all. And I should, you know, it's I should definitely mention like kind of what I do during that. Uh, you know, there's just a few things that I do during, like if I really want to cut down and get really lean. Uh, and that is the first thing is I'll start eating a little bit leaner. We kind of talked about that. And usually what I'll do is I'll make dinner first of all, the, the leanest meal. I, I like to keep a, uh, my breakfast the most fat in that because it's kind of you know satiating and that's about managing hunger. Uh, and so dinner would be the leanest meal. So I'll eat a little bit leaner. And as the cut goes, maybe I'll eat a little bit less. I'll maybe throw in a little bit of cardio. And then as time goes on, I'll gradually increase cardio if I want to keep losing fat. Uh, and those are kind of, those, that's basically it. So those, that's basically all I would do. And then until you get, and you'll eventually hit the body composition you want, eating a little bit less and a little bit leaner and increasing cardio slightly over time. And, you know, I did it for, 
uh, I think it was six or eight weeks. And I was planning on doing 12 weeks, but I, it was at like eight weeks. I was like, I, I'm at the body composition I want. Wow. And so I was done. Uh, but yeah, and it was, it really was easy from a, like a hunger standpoint. Cause when I had done bodybuilding competitions, which is basically the same kind of strategy, there's a little, you know, I do carb cycling, but same similar strategy. Uh, hunger is a huge issue. Energy is a huge issue because they, they just plummet. Energy plummets, hunger goes through the roof, uh, and you feel terrible during those times. And when I cut with just meat-based foods, it was, it, was, you know, it was the easiest cut I've ever done. How long did it take you to go from like eating three pounds to five pounds? I did that over the course of, I think it was six months. Six or seven months. And then it I, only I, took you about kind of eight weeks, but you had estimated about 12 weeks. Yeah, I honestly, I put on some body fat, but I did not put on very much body fat. You know, I, was, I was like, where's all this meat going? Like, <laughs> but I, I did not put on very, I didn't put all, all that much body fat on. Uh, you, I, I, no, go yeah, ahead. I, I, said I put on a little bit and, and that's one reason that, that you know, the cut was so short, only eight weeks is like, I didn't really have that much to lose. And I wasn't trying to compete or anything. I just want to get down to, you know, probably sub 10% body fat. And it just didn't take all that much time. That's interesting. So what about fasting? You know, some people use fasting as a tool to do all these things that you're talking about. Um, I think there's evidence where it shows that uh, fasting can help with insulin sensitivity. It's not just that it decreases it, but that it actually makes it more sensitive again. And it also, that fasting longer term, I don't know what the exact amount of time is, but you know, over 24 hours for sure, will also um, help your metabolic rate increase. Um, so do you use fasting? Do you recommend it? What are your thoughts? So my thoughts on fasting are kind of, I like to separate the discussion into health and then body composition because I think it has potentially very many benefits from a health standpoint. Uh, You know, autophagy, one, one of the things that like you mentioned, these research that shows, you know, increased insulin sensitivity, which doesn't shock me when you're eating less. Like, I mean, that makes sense. Uh, And it's a, some people find it helpful to help control calories and so that, that's where we start blending into body composition. Uh, and so it's kind of a, a means to not overeat. From a body composition standpoint, I think it's not ideal uh, because it goes back to the, the biggest thing, whether someone's trying to build muscle or lose fat. And the, the, what, what really gets lost is when, people, when fat loss, people focus on the scale, the weight going down, they focus on fat loss, and they don't think anything about the muscle side of the equation. And I would argue that, just as important as the fat loss is making sure that you don't lose muscle mass. And there's studies that show like if an average person goes on a diet over a quarter of the weight that they lose is muscle mass. And so the, the metabolism starts tanking and you got all kinds of problems. So one of the downfalls of fasting is you put muscle mass at a far greater risk if you are calorically restricted. Okay. Whereas if you're eating three meals a day, and you're stimulating muscle protein synthesis, three different occurrences throughout the day, you are protecting that muscle mass more close. You're better protecting the muscle mass. So let's just say both diets, one fasted diet eating 2,000 calories, other diet not fasting eating 2,000 calories. The diet that's eating those 2,000 calories over the course of three meals, I think is going to have more success in body composition. Uh, so then what about um, like one meal a day versus three? Do you think that three would actually have more kind of like protein, um, you know, saving? Yeah, absolutely. Oh, really? Okay. That's yeah, it's kind of, I know it's not a popular opinion because I know there's a fasting and I'm not against fasting. I'm just saying for people that have body composition goals, that is not, sometimes what gets complicated is if someone can use one meal a day and it, helps them restrict their calories to 1500 calories a day and they lose weight and they're like, okay, this is great. I lost, I lost weight. And a lot of times they, they don't like the word skinny fat, but that's kind of what happens is they lose muscle mass and they lose fat and they're not feeling as good as they could because they're only eating 1500 calories a day. And maybe they're not getting all the nutrition they could get into that one meal a day. Uh, and so they start potentially getting deficiencies in various things uh, versus if you just spread that out, uh, you can usually eat more. You can usually get a better, better body composition. Uh, and so I think 
my, my kind of to sum up my view on fasting, it, it can be a good tool, especially for people that are very overweight and just something to kind of hone things in. I think it can be good to do on occasion that, you know, I fast occasionally, not on purpose, but it's like, oh, I didn't, I, you know, I haven't eaten for 18 hours. I guess that's in some, in some realms of fasting that counts as like an intermittent fast. Uh, but I don't purposely do it because I, I feel better if I eat two or three meals a day. I feel like I'll get better body composition when I eat two or three meals a day. I have done fasting uh, in the past, like intermittent fasting regularly. And that's back when I was doing kind of the keto experiment when we were talking about earlier when I lost a lot of muscle mass. And one of it, one, some of that muscle mass loss was due to uh, restricting protein to 0.75 grams per pound. But I think a lot of it was also due to the, you know, the fasting I was doing at that time. Uh, so, I mean, I know not a popular opinion, but yeah, <laughs> so, I think it makes sense. I mean, I've seen studies where, you know, and this is like a big debate in the community of like, does fasting cause muscle lean, uh, you know, body mass to kind of deteriorate? And I think they show that, you know, it may during the fasting, but once you eat, it kind of like upregulates it. You know, I, I don't, I think the jury's out on that. I don't focus on that as much. So I don't know as much about that, but um, I do think, like you said, there's benefits. I mean, some people are just like, I refuse to gain weight. So then what other, you know, methods can they use to then at least, um, you know, at least increase metabolic rate. But I mean, I hear what you're saying where, well, if you're not also, but building body mass, then you're kind of, it's like this forever uphill battle, even if you use fasting, right? Because if you right. fast and you increase your metabolic rate, but then you're not building muscle or losing muscle mass, then your metabolic rate will also drop. So exactly it's a conundrum and it's, I mean, it's very interesting. I never thought of that point. So, I mean, that makes a lot of sense to me. Um, you know, one thing I would always say to people is, okay, look, if you are, you know, hell bent that, okay, I feel good at 1500 calories. I don't need any more nutrition. I don't feel bad then fine. But then at least you better make sure that every single nutrient that you're consuming or every calorie is the most nutrient dense. And that's where I'm like, you better be consuming liver at that point because if you, right, like, I mean, you will become, let's say you feel great for a while, but you'll become nutrient deficient, not just calorically deficient, right? Um, yep. I know you did like an experiment a while ago uh, where you ate liver and you, you noticed that you felt sated a lot earlier. Do you want to talk about that? I still feel that way. Oh, that's uh, nice. So if I, and I, so I, and I ran a poll in, uh, in, our, in our Facebook group. It to see, I'm like, does anyone else, does this happen to anyone else? And it, it, it seems to happen to a, a fair number of people where all other things being equal, as much as I could possibly control other variables, if I add liver into, I normally would eat it for breakfast, I notice that I'm not as hungry. Like my, I would normally be like, oh, I'm ready to eat lunch at this time. That gets delayed till later. And I, I, there's, I have a satiating effect with the liver. And I don't, I don't know any reason that, like why that is because it's not because I'm eating more calories, but it's like you're getting this micronutrient, super dense it food, is, right. and it's the body's like, whoa, maybe I need the that, that's all I need right now. Uh, I don't eat liver every day. I don't eat it. I don't. I, I wouldn't even say I even eat it regularly. I, I the, the grocery store I go to sells it in like a pound, and so I'll eat and it's sliced into four pieces. So I'll usually eat like a quarter pound over the course of a week. And then I usually probably go three weeks out e eating any and then I'll eat some more. Again. Uh, but yeah, I, I find it very, very satiating. Uh, and it's pretty consistent. Like each time I do that, it's, it's like I, I eat less if I eat liver. I, I think it makes sense from a, you know, a, you know, nutrient dense perspective. And so that's why I say, you know, to people that are, you know, under eating or not eating sufficient calories, well, then hedge your bets oh. by then, you know, your every single calorie better be the most nutrient dense. Um, so, you know, this kind of segues into supplementation. Do you supplement on carnivore? Have you ever? So I don't regularly supplement. I was just funny. I just posted about this last week at, and okay. I was saying, uh, this is my one supplement I take in. It was some, uh, salmon roe. So I've been, I, I've been taking my salmon roe supplement and I don't think it's necessary. It's kind of like what we we're just talking about. Like there's certain things that we feel like definitely not bad for me. I don't mind it it's only going to do good. So why not? And so that's kind of how I feel about the salmon row. You know, it's very high in DHA. 
you know, these essential omega-3 fatty acids. And so, and I don't mind it. It is a little bit expensive, but it's really not that bad if you break it down. And so I take, so I take uh, some frozen salmon roe, like a small spoonful, three to four times a week, maybe. Uh, and I've experimented with other supplements. And one of the interesting ones is creatine, because I had taken creatine monohydrate basically the, for the previous 20 years, like during my weightlifting time, pretty much all the time. Okay. Uh, and then I stopped taking it. Uh, and then, so I was curious in carnivore. And usually if you take creatine, I, you know, I would gain about five pounds of water weight from it. And red meat is very high in creatine. And so I thought, you know, my, my creatine stores are probably full. Uh, meaning like if I take more, it's just going to be excreted. So I did, I, so I tried some creatine, did not gain any weight. And so I was like, you know what? I probably am just full of creatine already. Uh, so that's one supplement I experimented with. I, I've experimented with electrolyte, electrolyte supplements as well, especially if, you know, in the summer and training and, or if I was doing that, I was doing a cut and I was sweating a lot and I was like, maybe I'll try some electrolytes. I don't think it's necessary for me, but you know, I, I experimented with them. And I was like, it didn't hurt anything. I don't think it helped anything. That's kind of how I felt with most supplements that I've, that I've uh, experimented with. I'm like, okay. not, not really doing anything, not necessary. Some people, the most common question I get about supplements is people that just want to hedge their bets, kind of like you're talking about. And I think I'm like, vitamin C is a common one. Sure. And, and if someone's starting a carnivore diet and they're uh, pre-diabetic or have some degree of insulin resistance and they're worried about vitamin C, I'm like, I would say, go ahead and supplement a little bit of vitamin C. I mean, I, I don't think it's going to hurt you. Uh, and especially if you're kind of metabolically compromised, maybe it's maybe not a bad idea. Uh, sure. But no, besides that, I, I, don't, I don't regularly supplement besides if I'm kind of experimenting with something. Right. And then sometimes you also, I think there was your guide and I'll link to everything in the show notes, but um, you, in your guide, you said when you transition, you may want to take some like ox bile. I think I forget what the lipase. Yeah. Lipase saved me uh, when I was transitioning. Cause yeah. Uh, yeah. There's some digestive enzymes that if you're not fat adapted, or even if you are fat adapted, uh, that can be helpful. And right. yeah, lipase was one ox bile has helped a lot of people. Uh, it's an HCL, uh, uh, supplement to help with stomach acid production. Yes, I, I, I agree with that. You know, um, let's transition a little bit. I know you're a dentist. And you know, um, a lot of people say that, you know, the sugar, sugar bugs come because you just have sugar kind of laying on your teeth. And so you just need to brush well and floss and that'll help save your teeth. But I wanted to talk about how actually like biochemically your your teeth can be rotting from you know, overconsumption of sugar and just how it um, kind of imbalances the pH of, you know, the blood and the calcium. If you kind of can just talk a little bit about that. Yeah. So, I mean, sugar is the teeth, like worst enemy. It's the dentist's best friend. I mean, without sugar, like dentists would, we would, we'd be out of business pretty fast. Maybe some orthodontists would survive, but uh, yeah. So sugar, I mean, the, the process is basically you have bacteria in your mouth and you have sugar substrate and together they will drop the pH in your mouth, basically uh, uh, dissolving the enamel, which is the hardest substance in your body. So this is not a normal process. I know in society it's very much been normalized, you know, oh, you just get a cavity, which, you know, this is not like something that should be happening. Uh, but, but yeah, that's what happens. And so with a carnivore diet, you're not eating carbs and, or sugar. Uh, your risk of developing caries is zero to minuscule because you do have some blood glucose and theoretically you could get some, you know, you, you have some glucose in the saliva, uh, which I don't know. I don't know if there's any, been any research done on this that shows that that's anywhere near substantial enough to initiate the decay process. Uh, nonetheless, I still do recommend brushing and flossing, uh, kind of like, uh, people are like, well, why should I brush and floss? And it's like, even if you eat the perfect diet, I'm going to recommend you work out. Like, and so it's, it, to me, it's, that's kind of, you know, working out the oral hygiene of the body. Well, you know, I, I don't think, you know, brushing and flossing is not going to hurt anything. It's only going to help stuff, uh, help things. So might as well. 
Okay, I, I just wanted to bring it up because, you know, there's a lot of, I think, myths about, you know, sugar and your teeth. And it's just that it's kind of on the surface and that's why it's rotting the teeth. So, hey, if you just rinse your mouth with water after a meal, you'll be fine kind of attitude. And I think it's just a lot deeper than that. And so I think you just explained it really well. Yeah, and you'll, you'll get, the, I mean, plaque, which is basically, you know, this biofilm that forms. You don't need sugar to, for, that, for plaque to form. And if you don't brush plaque off... Uh, with the minerals in your saliva, it can, you know, basically get hard and it turns into something called calculus or, or tartar. And then, you know, you can't really brush that off. You need a hygienist or your dentist to go to scrape that stuff off. Okay. And, Makes a lot. And, and yeah. And if you don't, I mean, the risk is, you know, gingival inflammation, periodontal disease, things like that. But uh, yeah, I, I still recommend basic oral hygiene, good oral hygiene practices. Yeah, no, I think it's good. I mean, sometimes we get meat stuck in our mouths or our teeth between our teeth. And it's because it is funny. Um, I do notice that there are some carnivores that are like, yeah, I don't brush my teeth, you anymore. know, multiple times a day anymore. So it's, it is funny, but yeah. Good. Um, so, you know, in terms of your eating, do you ever eat other than meat? Like, do you sometimes add a little bit of berries, chocolate? Um, so I, I wrote a long article a few months ago on carnivore and carbs, basically, because I had done, so I did some experiments with carbohydrates, uh, berries, honey, uh, those were the two, and avocado, because I went to experiment with fiber. Okay. Uh, so I wrote a long article on, uh, about that, and I know lots of other carnivores that, you know, basically the foundation of the food pyramid is animal-based foods, and then on top of that pyramid is things like lifestyle, culture, entertainment, even genetics to some point, some aspects. Some people are more tolerant for, you know, plant toxins than other people. Uh, and, and, do, and do fine with things. And some people, you know, a little bit of carbs help with certain people's individual situation and individual goals. Uh, so I think there's a place for carbohydrates uh, for some people. And, you know, will I, will I ever eat carbohydrates throughout the rest of my life? Probably. Uh, not for, like, health reasons. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so if I eat carbohydrates, it'll be more for, like, the lifestyle reasons uh, or it's kind of like alcohol. You know, no one drinks alcohol because it's healthy, right? People that do drink drink because it's more of, like, a lifestyle entertainment kind of thing. I personally don't drink. Uh, but, you know, I don't have anything against it. But it, I, I wouldn't say like, look, we're going to drink alcohol because we're going to try and, you know, get our, our, our hydration today or something right. like that. Right. Uh, so I, I mean, I'll probably eat carbs sometimes in my life, but it just won't be for health reasons, sure. <laughs> maybe bodybuilding reasons, but I, I'm I, that shit may have sailed too. So who knows? <laughs> Well, you know, there are some schools of thoughts where they say that if your, um, you know, your glucose levels are too low or your glycogen, then, um, you know, like insulin needs to kind of be woken up to then transport some of it to your cells. And so for women, they say that, you know, going too low carb can be damaging. I haven't personally seen it in my clients, especially when they start kind of increasing more of the fat for support of the hormones. Have you seen this kind of in your, even your meat health group? So it's very interesting. It's almost like the opposite of insulin resistance where you've eaten so low carb for so long that if you do eat carbohydrates, the body is used to sparing that glucose for the brain and the red blood cells. And so it doesn't get taken up into the muscles as are in the cells as it normally would. And so people will see initial blood like spikes in blood sugar early on when they reintroduce carbohydrates if they're monitoring and it's common. It's, it's, and it's not insulin resistance. It's actually like the exact opposite of insulin resistance, but there is almost like a transition a week or two of, you know, reintroduction of carbs to until the body has a normal insulin blood sugar response. Uh, and so, I mean, there's even an argument, you know, I don't, I wouldn't argue it yet, but there's an argument to be made that, okay, that maybe that's a reason for including carbs in a couple of days a week uh, to keep this basic total metabolic flexibility. You'd be able to use carbs for energy, fat, ketones. I can, I can use it all. Uh, so I, there, I think there's an argument for that. I'm not like the most dogmatic carnivore you've ever met. I'm, I'm for if like if people are going to use some carbs for life or for this or that, and, you know, I'm, I'm for it. My kind of 
what I feel like I've reached the conclusion is like what we were talking about the, the base of the food pyramid is animal based foods. Mm -hmm. And if you tinker on top of that experiment or individualize on top of that, uh, it can make a lot of sense for anyone's individual situation. Uh, so that's kind of how I stand up. <laughs> yeah, no, I think that makes a lot of sense. I mean, some people do better with a little bit of carbs and I think that's okay if your body can tolerate it. I don't think people should use it as an excuse to eat carbs. Um, exactly. If, right. Exactly. But exactly. you have to just find your bio individual needs and what seems to kind of work for your overall, not only your overall health, but your overall lifestyle. Right. So that's, a, that's the most important thing, the overall lifestyle. Yeah. Cause if it doesn't fit in that, then you're not going to stick with it anyways. Right. Right. right exactly. Mm -hmm. So as we're, you know, coming to a close, like what would be some, you know, like just some advice. Um, and I know, I know we've talked a lot about them, but, um, you know, just some maybe tidbits, tips, um, you know, support for, you know, doing a carnivore diet and, you know, and, and especially in terms of weight loss. So my, I guess my biggest piece of advice going into carnivore is really understanding why you're doing it. Because if there's not like, if someone's going into it, the a common thing was, I'm going to go into it because I'm going to lose five pounds. Yeah. I would say that's probably not, I, I mean, I, I advise not <laughs> or do a lot more research first. Uh, I mean, that's all. But I mean, if you really know your why, like, oh, I really want to get healthy or if maybe it is body composition and they listen to our talk here today and they're like, body composition is my main goal and I want to use carnivore to do it because I want to be healthy too. And I'm going to give it the time that it needs that's the right perspective. So gaining the perspective on your why and, you know, I think getting educated, listening to podcasts like this or reading articles uh, to really just, I think that helps people long-term, even if you don't need to know all the science, because I wrote this, this PDF uh, basically a little ebook on health dangers of a plant-based diet. And I go into a lot of the science of plant toxins and whatnot but I can't tell you how many people told me that they've read that and not so much for the science, but it's like, ah, I get it. This makes more sense. And now that I understand more of the reasons behind this, I'm more likely to stick with it. Uh, or they know just what things to really avoid as well. Uh, so I guess my biggest piece of advice would be like, really know you, like why, what, why you want to do it, what you want to get from it. And then do some back research. And there's, so many great sources of information like you're a perfect example and there's tons out there of really good information that you can get uh and then i think when you're armed with those two things like you're set up for success and then when it comes to weight loss i think the important thing is like we talked about is the the right perspective and i think if you have the right perspective uh and you're willing to you know put put in the time to you know reach those goals uh you know people will have success because like to me, at least, it's like fat loss is not, uh, it's not like a mystery. It's not like maybe it's going to work. Like if someone comes to me, like I, it's like I could pretty much like guarantee like we can get fat loss. It's not like, it's not like maybe it'll work, maybe it won't. Like, but like it's not, we can do it because <laughs> uh, there's science behind it. It's like, a, it's like an equation, input, output. Uh, so yeah, I, I think that would be my, my advice. Yeah. And I think one other thing is, I mean, those are all great things. Um, I think community is big, right? You've developed yeah. a huge community with meat health. And again, I'll link to that in the show notes, but um, you know, sometimes we are doing this kind of lifestyle alone. And so when we have community members that, you know, when we're kind of hitting a wall that can support you um, and not say blame the diet, but say maybe it's this and that, like that'll also help us to continue on. Absolutely. Community is so important. And in that community, I, I remember when I, I, I don't know how long ago it was, it was just me and, you know, five other people initially. And so I'm always in there answering all these questions, but now, you know, there's over 15,000 people in the, in the group that at meat health there's so many smart people that are just in there helping people answering questions. So it's a great source of like information and learning as well. Uh, so community support and information, it's, it's great. And it's like, man, I'm pretty much hands off in there now. I'm like, everyone else is answering all the questions. They got it down. It's great. Right. I mean, well, you probably were a very good resource to start with. And so then you're just kind of training the training. <laughs> Maybe. I don't yeah, know. I mean, I've yeah, been really great. used a lot of your resources to learn about carnivore when I first started too. So thank you for that. And Absolutely. I will again 
put all the you know information in the show notes. Um, so where can people find you? I would say, you know, I mean, all the norm, the, the usual suspects. My my one resource, I'd, you know, if you want more information, is just my news, my Saturday newsletter. I send out a newsletter every week, Saturday, and if I have anything good to say, it'll be in there. Uh, I'm in social media, but you know, not as often. <laughs> well, I'll include all of them in the show notes. This has been very helpful. Thank you so much for joining me today. Well, thanks for having me on. It's been fun. Okay. Thanks, Kevin. Bye. Thanks. Bye. All right, guys, I hope that this video has been helpful for you. I hope that, you know, as talking with Kevin Stock, that you realize that sometimes our body needs a little bit of extra work or a little bit of extra support to get to the ideal weight that we want to be. Sometimes we've been under eating for so long so that our body's metabolic rate is disrupted and so we need to do the right things to get our metabolic rate working better. I hope that this video has helped you in finding ways to find your optimal health. All right guys, you know the drill, make sure to eat a lot of meat, take care of your bodies because it is the only place you have to live. Take care guys, I'll talk to you soon, bye.